judgment in the matter of guess and another against guess. This appeal raises an important issue about the underlying purpose of the equitable doctrine usually labelled proprietary estoppel. It has troubled academic writers for some years. Proprietary estoppel arises where the owner of property, usually land, gives an assurance to another person, often a child of theirs, that they either already have or will be given or will inherit that property or an interest in it. And the person receiving that assurance then acts in reliance upon it to their disadvantage, or as lawyers call it, to their detriment, following which the owner of the property goes back on the assurance or dies without making it good. I will call the property owner A and the recipient of the assurance B. There is no contract between them which B can enforce, so the common law is powerless to help them. But the court's equitable jurisdiction gives the judge a discretionary power in such a case either to enforce that assurance, for example by ordering a transfer of the property in question to B, or by granting some different or lesser remedy, which may be an order for payment of the value of the property in question by A or out of A's estate, or some lesser sum if the full value would be wholly disproportionate to the detriment suffered by B. The issue which has divided academic opinion is as to the purpose of this equitable remedy. Is it to give effect to B's expectation, so that B receives what he has been promised, or is it to compensate B for the detriment suffered in reliance upon it, or is there some different purpose? The facts of this case are typical of many which have given rise to this issue. The defendants, David and Josephine, own a farm. They have three children, Andrew, the claimant, Ross and Jan. They promised Andrew, the eldest, when he was in his teens, that if he spent his life thereafter living and working on the farm for his parents, he would inherit a sufficient part of it to be able to continue a viable farming business there and to live there after their deaths. Relying on that promise after leaving school in 1982, Andrew spent some 32 years living on the farm in a small cottage, later with his wife and children, and working there at relatively low wages. His parents made wills giving effect to their assurance, and they made him a partner with them in the farming business. But Andrew and his parents then fell out. In 2014, David and Josephine cut Andrew out of their wills. They dissolved the business partnership with him and evicted him and his family from the cottage. Andrew now lives elsewhere and works on, but doesn't own, another farm. He has brought the present claim based on proprietary estoppel. The child judge found that the necessary elements of assurance and detrimental reliance had been established by Andrew. But his parents, the defendants, were still living in the farmhouse and many years might still pass before they died, which was the time when they had promised that Andrew would inherit. The judge decided that there had to be a clean break between Andrew and his parents. So he ordered the farm to be sold and the proceeds divided between Andrew and his parents. Andrew was to get 40% of the value of the farm, the amount which had been promised in the parents' wills, but discounted by reference to his early receipt of the value of the farm house. He was also to receive 50% of the value of the assets of the farming business to reflect his partnership share. The aggregate amount was £1.3 million. The parents appealed, but the Court of Appeal upheld the judge's order, so the parents have appealed to this court. They say that the amount which Andrew is to receive under the judge's order is more than the value of the detriment suffered by Andrew and more than the net value of the contribution which he made to the farming in excess of what he was paid. Their case squarely raises the question whether fulfilment of expectation or compensation for detriment should govern the relief to be awarded in cases of proprietary estoppel. After extended deliberation, this court remains divided over this issue. Lord Leggett, with whom Lord Stevens agrees, 
would hold that the court should fashion a remedy which does the minimum necessary to ensure that B, in this case Andrew, suffers no detriment from A's repudiation of the promise, or is compensated for that detriment. That might be achieved by enforcing the promise, but not if that would more than compensate for the detriment suffered. They would have reduced the payment to Andrew to £610,000 as their best estimate of the value of his detriment. In my judgment, with which Lady Arden and Lady Rose agree, I review many of the reported cases both in this jurisdiction and in Australia. They show that the remedy has generally been based on fulfilment of expectation and not on compensation for detriment, but that a variety of factors may cause the court to do something different or even less in value than a strict enforcement of the promise. Strict enforcement might be impossible if the property has been sold in the meantime. Or it might be unfair to others with a claim on A's bounty. Or even unfair to A, who may need the property or its value to meet unanticipated expenses during old age or ill health. Or it may be so wholly disproportionate to the detriment looked at broadly to make strict enforcement of the promise or an award of its full value unjust to A. These factors explain why equity is, in this area, at its most flexible in terms of remedies. I identify the real underlying aim of the equitable doctrine as being to put right the unconscionability inherent in A's going back on a promise which B has relied on to their detriment. That will generally be achieved by enforcing the promise. But the presence of complicating factors, such as those described above, may mean that the unconscionability can be remedied in some other and even lesser way. The court should look at any proposed remedy and ask, if A now provided that to B, would A be acting unconscionably in all the circumstances? That conclusion is broadly supportive of the, of the approach to this case taken by the judge and by the Court of Appeal, subject to one point. There is no equitable power to give B more than A promised. In this case, the judge did so because in giving Andrew 40% of the value of the farm now, he accelerated the date upon which his parents' promise was to be enforced, since they may have many years to live. The need for a clean break where a family has fallen out may make that acceleration necessary, but not without a sufficient discount for early receipt. The judge did order a discount in relation to the farm house, but not for the much more valuable share of the farm land which he awarded to Andrew. Further, since the parties had already achieved a clean break in their daily lives, it would not be unconscionable if the parents preferred for them now to place the farm on trust in part for Andrew on their death. The parents should be able to choose between doing that and selling the farm now with a fully discounted payment to Andrew for his early receipt. Therefore, the appeal will be allowed to that limited extent, and if the amount of any payment or the terms of the trust cannot be agreed, those questions will be remitted to the High Court. <laughs>